Hello and welcome to the first Fault to Shah learning series of 2022. This is the 10th in this series. Um, so welcome everybody who's returning or those who are seeing it for the first time. Um, I'd like to welcome Afanasos Ganas today. Um, he's the research director in active tectonics, GNSS, remote sensing, geodynamics um, in the National Observatory of Athens. Um, and for those of you who have seen the title of the talk today, you will see that that is uh, the most appropriate um, background we could have for him because he's going to be talking about space geodesy and continental deformation. He's an appointed member of the Greek National Committee for Evaluation of Seismic Hazard. Um, so it's particularly relevant to the Fault to Shah Working Group. Uh, most of us in the field probably know him very well and his work. He has over 3,700 citations, an H index of 33, um, multiple Academy of Athens awards. He's an elected member of the Scientific Council of the Institute of DI Dynamics um, and NOAA. Uh, he's also been editor in chief for the bulletin of the Geological Society of Greece. I could go on and on, uh, but I'd rather hear from him today. So I'm going to pause there. Um, apologies. I know there are many more accolades to your name, but I, we really want to hear what you have to say. To remind everyone, um, this series really is a chance to learn about lots of different topics that relate to faults in seismic hazard assessment. The idea is if we can really understand them, then we can hopefully collaborate more and make sure that we really are understanding all the more detailed research talks we get. So with that in mind, um, please do ask questions. If there's anything you want clarity on, um, do ask, and uh, Afanasios will be happy to answer either as you go along um, or at the end. Um, you can also put questions in the chat and I can relate them on. So without further ado, I will hand over and... Uh, look forward to today's session. So thank you again for coming, Afanasios. I know it's a very busy time and we really appreciate it that you're here with us. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joanna, for your kind words. I really appreciate that. You also do a very great job there. So um, I'm very honored that um, you invited me to give this talk today. Um, from the start of my career, let's say, um, can you hear me well? Yeah, okay. Um, from the start of my career, I, I um, was very much interested in, in, the, in the quantitative aspects of our research, not only just drawing maps and cross sections, but actually measuring, uh, measuring um, uh, uh, offsets, measuring uh, slip rates, uh, measuring displacements, whatever we can. Uh, uh, we can offer as geosciences to the to understanding the physics of um, of our of our science, more or less. So this is the um, what I'm trying to present to you today. Some uh, summary of a few uh, works. I think they are important for the rest of the community. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Right. Okay. Looks good. All right, great. So, um, so I will uh, present a few cases that we understood quite well um, in the AGN, general AGN area using space geodesy, using uh, geodetic data, uh, and using these data in, of course, in collaboration with seismology and geology. So um, we can agree today, it's, I think it's well understood and agreed uh, among all the community that uh, we can use uh, space geodesy data to, uh, to visualize, to have a specialized view of earthquake deformation. Uh, this is a very, very fundamental uh, uh, aspect of such data. Second is to get information of fault slip rates and uh, on uh, velocities, tectonic velocities. Again, this is well respected today, this data set. And again, um, a, a new, perhaps slightly new uh, information you can get from space geodesy is on release patterns of earthquake energy in terms of magnitude scaling. This is, uh, this is applicable to, um, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, a growing 
um, growing investments um, on, on the engineering and ge geoscientific community on early warning. So space geodesy can supply uh, useful information on all these things, right? So what we can um, what we can uh, learn from uh, from this wealth of data is that um, we can have um, a set of deformation histories, let's say by insert GNSS seismology, and uh, insert and GNSS provide reliable maps of ground changes. Okay. Again, we use these maps to invert, to locate the seismic source, especially when the seismic source is blind. And then, of course, uh, by uh, adding all these pieces of um, deformation on a map, along a map, aligning this, we can um, have a clue on the existence or not of a seismic gap in space, maybe near, maybe soon in time also, so we can approximate the seismic potential of this gap but not again to predict earthquakes, perhaps to predict the spatial location, but not the timing, right? So on this, on this, uh, let's say sketch to the right, you have this um, the data, and then you combine this with seismology sometimes, and you get the model of the displacement along the rupture um, surface, the fold, then you can uh, perhaps do some other modeling using some uh, typical stress change tools and then interpret uh, using the geological structure. Okay, so those, it all um, have to agree more or less on, um, on the same uh, scale uh, on the kinema, on the kinema, of the kinematic point of view. Right, so I'm going to present now some, we, using these principles, we're going to present some key results using insert and GNSS. Um, including mapping of permanent ground displacements and interseismic strains, with emphasis of mapping of pre seismic and post seismic deformation from shallow earthquakes in a variety of settings, on the calculation of tectonic strain, and modeling the kinematics of surface motions using models involving crustal blocks. To introduce you in the area, people perhaps not familiar if they uh, watch us from around the world, okay, we have a collisional plate boundary where um, Africa and Nubia is subducting beneath Eurasia. Uh, so Nubia is moving to the north uh, approximately with a velocity of about uh, five millimeters per year. Whereas the overriding plate, the Eurasian plate moves mostly on the central part of the Aegean to the southwest with a velocity of 33 to 35 millimeters per year. All this motion, so it's more or less um, uh, it's not a typical subduction environment because the overriding plane, the velocity of the overriding plate is, uh, is many times the, the velocity of the subducting plate. So it uh, resembles more of a continental thrust type of setting than a subduction, but this is the case. Of particular, of, of particular interest here is the shape of the subduction, which um, in turn influences the geometry of the upper plate introducing a strong uplift of the arc all the way from Kefalonia to Southwest Peloponnese to Crete and to Rhodes. So in terms of geology, what we get is we get um, um, uh, a wide area of extension that is um, uh, started more or less on the Miocene leading to the formation of metamorphic core complexes here on the Cyclades and uh, Western Anatolia. Um, and uh, this, this followed the closure of the Neotethys Ocean um, sometime in Eocene, Paleocene times. So since then, we have in this area, in the South Aegean and um, uh, in Anatolia, we have uh, uh, the, the, prevail, the prevail of extension, whereas on the West Arc and uh, in the um, uh, soft intermination, the Danarids, compression is still ongoing. So in this area, there is compression. All this area is extension and compression on the other arc. And then we have also compression on the Cyprian arc and uh, the continuous subduction there. Of course, all this, um, uh, on this um, collisional an extensional environment on, on the back arc area leads to um, an elevated seismic hazard. So the latest estimates from the global earthquake model 
for the area of central Greece, for example, here is Athens. This is the Gulf of Corinth. This is the Western Hellenic. This is the, um, um, the islands of Kefalonia, Lefkada, and Zakynthos on the Western Arc. They are um, modeled as um, highly seismic hazard areas of the Eurasian plate, reaching values up to um, almost 1G. Uh, this is values is uh, for 50 years estimates of 10% um, uh, exceedance um, for the next 50 years. Now, looking at the data, uh, this is a map showing velocity vectors uh, with respect to Europe. So it's clearly seen that um, the tectonic velocities increase um, somewhere to the south of Serbia and uh, Romania towards the North Aegean Trough. Uh, and uh, south of that, the velocities increase dramatically towards the trench. But there also there is a rotation. Uh, if you look at um, the uh, vectors here in Western Anatolia, you, you see a counterclockwise rotation towards the trench. Um, and this is uh, on the other side, when you look at the Apulia, you see the velocities spreading to the north. So um, there is convergence in this area and um, extension on the, on the main part of the Aegean. Of course, there is, uh, if you look at along the the North Anatolian trough in the Marmara Sea, there is uh, right lateral uh, motion, which um, it's comes from the well-known North Anatolian fault and propagation to the North uh, Aegean Sea. Um, looking at the data, what you can uh, we can have an idea of the accuracy of these uh, um, of these velocities. So we published a paper last year with Pierre Briol when we looked at the 110 pairs of stations that are separated by less than 15 kilometers in distance. So we look at the Northeast up um, on the time series of these um, stations and comparing those, you see that, for example, that um, uh, the data indicate that uh, the uncertainties are more or less of the order of one millimeter per year in the horizontal. For example, in the east, this is the east to west, this is the north south, and this is the up. So you see for about 110 stations, the, the scatter is around or less than one millimeter per year. The same also in the north-south component, but of course they increase the two millimeters uh, per year on the vertical. So it gives, this gives you um, um, an, uh, a picture of the quality of the data we're dealing with. Those are those stations are, um, GNSS stations operating in the area for more than 10 years. This is an example of the data we collect. Um, of course, on the, on the left, you see campaign stations. On the right, you see permanent stations uh, on bedrock. Uh, here, are a few campaign stations, or most of the campaign stations should be on the bedrock as well, but sometimes we have to do uh, collect data on let's say, um, uh, coastal environments where the stability is not as good as the bedrock one. In, in terms of antennas, we always do geodetic antennas, um, which are choke ring as well, that are um, very useful in um, uh, isolating uh, uh, noise from signal. Um, Again, uh, on the vertical, um, the signal on the vertical, um, here you see another map with 177 data points of which 68 uh, stations, uh, the velocities are uh, known with an uncertainty of less than 0 0.7 millimeters per year. So there are areas, for example, uh, along the arc where, where there's subsidence and uh, remember the picture I showed you in my third slide uh, where you see an uplift. So geologically speaking, there is uplift all the way, but GNSS in this uh, several locations, they record the interseismic uh, signal, which interseismic signal means that these, these stations here in the 
um, for example, here in Pilos uh, or some other stations um, in Kefalonia, also in Crete, they record the, um, the subsidence, the interseismic subsidence, which is due to the drag of um, the upper plate from the lower plate. And um, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this will stop when the next earthquake occurs and will uplift the, um, uh, the site of the station. So there's a lot of green. Green uh, is around zero stability, or, uh, but uh, most of the data indicate um, a substance along the arc. And of course, there are some local phenomena, like, for example, with um, uh, with uh, black color, we have subsidence more than two millimeters per year. There are some locations here near Thessaloniki where we know we have uh, uh, some issues with uh, uh, groundwater um, over pumping. But other places like here in the Gulf of Corinth, this is this uh, uh, large dark uh, station is uh, the island of Trizonia, which shows um, uh, tectonic substance. So using this data now, we can uh, construct uh, maps of continental scale deformation. So looking all the way here now from Serbia, Romania, down to Peloponnese, you see the um, principal strain axis with um, Red color is extension with blue is compression. And you can compare this, this image here on the left, which is coming from uh, geodesy to the image on the right of the map on the right, which is the data seismology, where you see extensional focal mechanism with um, the red color and compressional with the blue color. You see that uh, the boundary between compression and extension is nicely uh, in agreement between uh, geodesy and seismology. So you can follow all the way from um, um, Montenegro, Northern Albania, down to um, Greece with compression to the west and extension to the right. And this also here, you can see um, also the orientation, the orientation of the compression axis here, the sigma one is in agreement with focal mechanism and on the other side, you see um, the agreement of the, uh, again, the least principal um, uh, stress axis with the uh, principal axis of strain. Um, strain increases. Um, this is the scale bar here is 50 nano strain, um, increasing from uh, about 20 to 30 nano strain here in uh, Macedonia, Thessaly. And when you cross, the bounder, the bounders, the, the rifts of um, Evia goes uh, over 50, 60, 70 nano strains. And when you reach the Gulf of Corinth, you get values of about 250 nano strains per year of extension, very fast extension. The other important result is the rotation of the extension. You see here the extension rotates from northwest, southeast to north, south, then it rotates again to east, west. So this is fantastic within a scale of about um, 400 kilometers, stre the stress rotates, the strain rotates twice uh, from, uh, let's say, east, west, north, south, east, west. It just gives you um, a very, very uh, nice and uh, clear questions, scientific questions. Why is that happening? What's the reason for that? Um, and of course, the answer is a combination of uh, geodynamic process occurring at the same time, but on a, a sort of like very close space. Okay, excuse me about that. So um, um, this information, of course, uh, 20 years ago would be um, un unbelievable to, to map. Okay, the data were just seismological data. But now we have all this information from, from space and we see that we can learn so much, so much more, so many more things about the, the way Earth deforms than uh, with the previous data sets. So um, next thing we can learn, of course, is 
how much coupled is the is the plate the are the plates between um, the overriding and the and the uh, down going plate for example here if you look at this data this is genesis data and you um, um, solve the if you um, uh, compute the velocities on the West Hellenic arc with respect to station Kala here in Calabrida, okay, what do you see? You see clearly that um, there, is a, there is another pattern west of Pyrgos, Amaliada, Patras. Um, and the pattern is that you have all these uh, velocities to increase systematically towards the plate boundary, which is the Kefalonia transform and also to the south. So you can visualize this imaginary line that separates more or less two, um, two areas of the upper plate, this area here and Peloponnese. So this is an important result. Of course, what, what else we can see, we can see that there is a lot of coupling because of the um, large um, scale of the, of the velocity vectors uh, whereas over here, the, um, this, the coupling is less. Um, we can, of course, uh, make some more analysis of these data sets. For example, if we consider the, the velocities of the central Aegean Sea, we um, uh, subtract the velocity of um, stable Europe, we get this uh, picture where you see an area here in East Peloponnese and the islands with Cycladis all the way down to a region Sadorini that uh, the velocities are, you cannot see the vector at all. It's within the errors uh, of the ellipses. But when you uh, go outside this boundary, you see the velocities to appear again. So that indicates that this is more or less a stable area in the central Aegean Sea. Uh, uh, and, um, an area we used to call crustal block. Using all this data, I showed you before, mostly GNSS so far. What we can do is we can um, create uh, kinematic units or blocks, which is uh, these blocks are um, solely, let's say, based on uh, uh, geodetic information. But in most cases, they agree with seismology and geology. And this is the size. What I was showing you before, this is the central Aegean block, which uh, can be extended um, until we reach the boundary here of the Gulf of Corinth, one case. Another case is this line I showed you before, separating Peloponnese from Western, uh, the Western arc. Another line is, of course, the um, boundary between the North Anatolian trough um, from um, this area of the Aegean and with Thrace and all Macedonia. Etc. Of course, this this um, uh, this is a good map of blocks. Which why is that? Because it can fit the velocities with uh, an RMS error of less than one millimeter per year. So it's a strong strong kinematic constraint. So we cannot ignore this picture. Of course, uh, in in a lot of cases, this um, is, is not an agreement with the occurrence of earthquakes. For example, here or from other geological data. For example, here we have an area where the faults, we know from geology, the faults are uh, oriented east-west and the boundary is crossing them. So this is not really a line. It's more or less a diffuse boundary. There is some uh, change, significant change in velocities between these two domains. But from seismology, we know that the faults are east-west and they are active. The same also is the case here in, uh, in this area, the Pindos block. I'll show you uh, some uh, uh, results more of that later. Um, I told you before that we can, um, uh, we can use this uh, technology to measure the offsets due to earthquakes. Uh, on the far right, you see the deformation, the co-seismic deformation um, of the 6.7 earthquake that occurred uh, west of Strophales and south of Zakynthos on the 25th of October 19, uh, uh, 2018. 
This is the epicenter here. We have data from, four, from 14 GNSS stations that um, permit us to associate the deformation with this low angle um, fault plane highlighted by seismology. So the fit is quite good, as you can see. Between um, the red is the, uh, the measured and the white is the predict from the model. Here on the right, on the, on the left, sorry, if you, if you combine all this information over the years, the last uh, 50 years or so, from um, seismology and from geodesy, you can highlight areas where you can see some seismic gaps, i.e. places where they are located between rupture areas. Uh, in this case, for example, here we have a rupture area that um, uh, has, uh, is highlighted here in the orange rectangle that is the rupture area of the 2014 January 26 earthquake. And from seismology, we have a rupture area of, six, of, an, of an earthquake 6.6 .6 to the uh, west of Zakynthos. So in this, because it's plate boundary and because it's coupled, I name it a seismic gap. Another seismic gap is located south of the rupture area of this earthquake and of the, uh, the rupture area of earthquake number 10, which earthquake number 10 is the uh, 1997 6.6 .6 event. The green rectangle is the 2018. Another seismic gap is located further south. Of course, there are gaps here and here. But this information would not be possible without um, the constraint, the good constraint we have the co-seismic ruptures using space geodesy. Um, on the other side of the Aegean, I'm going to give you some examples now of this excellent data we have. We have the, the earthquake that occurred in, on October of 2020 with magnitude 7.0. Um, occurred offshore, okay, somewhere over here. Now, using all these offsets that we collected from Genesis stations around the, around the epicenter, look at that, they're very excellent offsets. For example, this station here, um, station SAM U is this station uh, onto the east of the, very close this determination of the fault. Compare the displacements, of this station with station SAMO in Karlovasi, which is this vector here. Here we map a cosmic motion to the south. This is the red is north-south motion to the south, about 37 centimeters. A six centimeters motion towards um, the west and an uplift of about nine centimeters of this station here. Um, this is very useful data, demonstrating very efficiently the um, effects of faulting on, on landscape and, and the long-term evolution of basins. Uh, and then we have INSOR, okay, a second tool. It's fantastic, again, we have this opportunity to, to use um, imaging radar to, to map not only point, uh, not only to collect data with GNSS uh, along points, but collect data over surfaces with INSAR. And the, the principle of INSAR, as you most of you know already, is that we have uh, an active sensor in space. We, we use a beam um, of, of the surface, and then we collect uh, uh, another image of the same area after some weeks or some months. Then of course, on, in the same on the same point, if we have a displacement, we can uh, map this as a change in range, delta r. And this is now mature, but of course, the first five, ten years or so, there were a lot of there were there some issues with the nature of the of the phase of the wave, um, how to unwrap the phase to correct for atmospheric effects. The orbits, etc. Now it's well respected and it's considered as mature technology. So, give you an idea of the quality of the data we have now, and the very nice agreement between GNSS and INSAR. Here is an image of a graph, better saying, between GNSS station we have in um, 
near Patras. Um, so we can project the GNSS velocity along the line of sight with the insert. So the, the black is the GNSS data and the orange is the line of sight insert. So you see the trend and the amount of velocities are very much in agreement within, uh, within three millimeters per year. And then we, in this particular case, we investigate the change in the velocity with respect to rainfall patterns. You see, for example, here there is an increase in INSAR on the rate of INSAR after a heavy rainfall period. So this is quite good. We can more or less control the um, uh, quality of the INSAR data with GNSS and vice versa. And we find very good agreement. Using INSAR, we can map large scale with unprecedented accuracy. Here, with the, I give you an example of, um, this, of course, seismic displacement along the East Anatolian Fault. We had an earthquake in 2020 in January. Here we have, we map the fault parallel motion. The, the motion is left parallel, uh, left lateral, sorry. Uh, here's the epicenter. You see most of the motion is to the west of the epicenter, about uh, 10 kilometers. All this area, this is the Euphrates River, which is already, which is, has been shifted or, or uh, displaced to the left during its course. And uh, we can map uh, so nicely in such a big detail that you can actually see that um, there is some um, left lateral motion south of the supposed uh, uh, trace of the fault according to geology, which means that there are some local effects here that have to be taken into account or the trace has to be shifted probably a few hundred meters to the south. And um, we can use this information to uh, uh, compare with geological data and to, um, to see, for example, if, um, uh, if the displacement, the, the geological displacement along strike of this fault um, is in agreement with the displacement of the 2020 earthquake. The patterns are the same. For example, here we have, uh, we, we have some uh, displacement profiles across the fault. You see from um, almost no displacement in uh, profile one, you go to the profile 11, which is this one here, you see uh, displacement, the relative displacement of about half a meter. Um, again, this data set is available because of INSAR. Another fantastic case, which is really one of the best I've ever seen in, in globally, is the case we had last March in uh, central Greece, in Thessaly, when, we, uh, when, when uh, three earthquakes occurred within um, uh, time period of nine days, and you can overlay an amazing stuff. You can overlay the interferograms of all three earthquakes and see how they overlap. This clearly indicates uh, the elastic response of the crust, the, the crust that has subsided because of uh, a 6.3 event, which is here, the first interferogram, suffered repeated deformation because of the second event, which is this one occurred the next day. And then, and then uh, one week later, we had a third, a third minor event here in the Northwest corner. And um, here I'm just showing you some effects of the earthquake, which basically we had extensive liquefaction in the South and some cosmic, um, uh, a few cosmic ruptures uh, in this area here. I will speak more about this in a moment. And this, this set of earthquakes occurred within the Pindos crustal block that was delineated by GNSS. So this strain, this 30 nano strains per year on average um, is responsible for the occurrence of these earthquakes within the block. Uh, going to more detail, uh, this is the, the sequence of these uh, three earthquakes showing here that you see this um, uh, steep gradient of, um, of uh, fringes indicating the fault deep to the east, the same here, dips to the north. Here, 
the gradient is steeper on the north side, so this fault dips to the south. And the total displacement we can decompose into uh, a vertical on the on the left and the east west on the right. You see that on the vertical of a point, this is the cross section with the cumulative displacement reaches almost uh, 40 centimeters on the hydro wall. And the east west displacement is more or re reaches about 20 centimeters on this area here. Uh, this is permanent displacement due to the earthquakes, mostly co seismic and less post seismic. Um, we'll talk about that in a moment. And again, uh, in this particular case uh, of these three blind faults that we have, uh, I have plot here the, uh, the surface projections, first event, second event, third event, um, is shown in relation to the uh, faults we already know in this area from geological data, that um, the um, uh, that the faults to the west, the big active faults of the west, they are blind in this case, which means that um, this area, despite the fact that there is um, there is not um, let's say a well developed active scarp, for example, this is one of those which is in um, in continuation to the, to the, the faults, the active faults further, further east, uh, or the, it has only a few active scarps, it's still capable of hosting destructive earthquakes. Um, another case when we use insert data is there was a couple of earthquakes in 2020, in February, near the Turkish Iranian border. That was an event of 5.8. Look at the shape of the border here. This is the Turkish Iranian border um, east of Lake Van. Um, this event was a 5.9, 5.8 occurred on uh, the um, uh, 0553. And you see the uh, there's a subsidence ball here indicating a normal fault. And uh, 10 hours later, on the same area, look again, this corner, there was a strike slip event, magnitude six. So this is not, this is not fantastic. Imagine in, within 10 hours, there was a uh, doublet in the same area and the, um, the displacements um, uh, have to, they, they overlay, so the ground that, um, in red, you see some substance of two centimeters, for example, here, due to the first event, he had to be shifted by another 10 centimeters due to horizontal shear. And this um, response, this elastic response of the crust would have never been possible without a space geodesy. Um, so we use this data to also to locate, as I told you, seismic gaps. So here, for example, on the uh, Kefalonia transfer fault on the western side of the Hellenic arc. We map using this data. So the ruptures are with these rectangles 2003, 2015, 2018. So we spot the gaps. So these gaps are locations of future earthquakes. So with INSAR, we imaged clearly three out of four earthquakes. The fourth earthquake is this one, 1983, because uh, at least it was located offshore. And we can recognize three seismic gaps that have the potential of magnitude five to six earthquakes. And of course, the, there is a 40 year gap um, to the uh, west of Paliki Peninsula that has already uh, accumulated enough strain to release an earthquake of 6.5. Now, I'm going to talk to you very briefly because we ran out of time about the post seismic aspect of the formation. Here is an, um, um, a displacement um, diagram uh, looking at the east component of station Zakynthos uh, before and after the October 2018 earthquake. So you, you, can, you can fit the post seismic, the earthquake is here. There is um, a motion. Uh, um, a three centimeter uh, co-seismic motion 
um, or say at least three, four centimeters, let's say, cosmic motion to the west, okay, from here to here. And then you see the data. If you, you can fit the data with this red line, which is the exponential post-seismic, that means until this data now become, uh, until the antenna stabilizes uh, for a month, two months later. And you can uh, may basically measure this, uh, the duration of this exponential um, adjustment of the, of the data, which is uh, coming out to be 21 days. So for 21 days, the antenna was moving after this earthquake. So you can have an idea of the, of the motion of the ground, of the, of the hanging wall of this fault um, after the main shock. Another beautiful case is the earthquake in Croatia, in Petrinja, that occurred um, in um, December 2020. Here, you can see beautifully uh, that um, uh, you can see the fault line Okay, very nice, even on the post seismic. And this is a post seismic uh, unwrapped in the ferrogram. So here is the, um, uh, the scale is you see, very small, about one centimeter. But clearly, you can see the boundary here. That's the epicenter. Looking at the right, nicely, you can see that the um, fault is non planar. So from here, you deviate and you go in this direction. Very, again, most of the formation uh, on the corner, on the bend, uh, again, with an amount of about one centimeter. And this data is one week, 31st of December until 6th of January. So it is clear that um, the formation occurs <clears throat> along non-planar surfaces, and you can measure it, and you can, um, <clears throat> you can model it, of course. Here I'll uh, give you an example of the previous normal fault earthquake in uh, Thessaly, where you can see you can see the post seismic uh, image. The post seismic this is work in progress now. We do in the post seismic case we have data from um, um, after the main shock, the third of March until the 9th of March, and this is one centimeter of post seismic motion. And the sign the the, the sign of reversal is exactly here when we have mapped. In the in the post seismic in the ferrogram, so this is the post seismic and the post seismic. We see this uh, line uh, when we have the reversal of the phase, and this is the ground cracks we found um, to the north of Village Zarko. So another case, one of the few cases we have clear post seismic signal along um, along the um, projection um, uh, the projection of the fault plane that was responsible for this earthquake. Give me one second to show you. Um, here, we are talking about here on the search projection of this fault line. Okay, we we can also one week later we can map uh, post seismic deformation using INSAR. Okay, here, which is another very good data set. Another example of we can map post seismic deformation using INSAR. And, and from GNSS, we can um, evaluate, we can measure the post seismic contribution to the total moment. In the Aegean area, using uh, about 15 years of data, we can uh, estimate about 70% uh, contribution to the total moment coming from post seismic deformation. Um, about a few words about the high rate, we can uh, also uh, learn. Uh, many things about the way faults rupture using GNSS uh, high rate one one hertz data, and this is an example of um, uh, GNSS displacement waveform uh, for the Petrini earthquake. Where here we have the time of the earthquake. This is the arrival of the P wave, and this is the arrival of the S wave. When you have the arrival of the S wave, you have the motion of the antenna of the order of um, this is four centimeters, say seven centimeters peak to peak motion of the antenna. Um, so we can, uh, if we have high rate genesis stations close to the fault, we can correlate this to the slip history of a patch. And if we have it more to a distance, <clears throat> we can image 
uh, a larger portion uh, of slip history. So of course, that means that we need more stations close to the faults, as closer to the fault as possible. And this is a strategy I have been following for the last 15 years. Um, using data from uh, high rate data in the case of the 2020 uh, East Anatolian fault earthquake, we see clearly that um, uh, we, can, we map three patches of deformation. This is, the, uh, this is uh, a section along strike. And this is um, the patches, this uh, uh, shallow patch and two deeper patches and showing seismicity. This is the aftershocks. This is the pre, uh, the pre shocks. We see the seismicity is nicely distributed around the slip patches with the exception of these, these events here. So um, we can uh, explain why is that happening because we have a release of uh, accumulated strain energy um, on the patch. And then we have um, aftershocks away from the patch or around the main patch. Uh, another um, use of this data is to uh, be able to scale the magnet with uh, displacement using um, uh, some mathematical formula using, for example, the peak ground displacement or the peak ground displacement squared. We have the data because we have the peak ground displacements, and then we can we have the we have the location of the station, so we can uh, have a, a regression, L1 norm regression, trying to find the relation between displacement and magnitude. And of course, um, we, have, um, we have a clear scaling, for example, here with the uh, magnitude 7, 6.5, 6, and 5.5, we plotted all the displacements. Um, of GNSS displacements um, and the earthquakes that occurred in the Aegean area since 97. So, for example, if magnitude 7, I show you these um, symbols are the 24th of May of 2014 earthquake in North Aegean Sea, which was 6.9 uh, from seismology. So, here you see that the data fit very well, uh, the genetic data fit very well, this, uh, um, this uh, seismological result. Um, also, excuse me, um, also here in that case, we see that the data, uh, we can have uh, an estimate of the magnitude of the earthquake, for example, in the case of Lefkada, which was 6.5, a few seconds, because when we have the arrival of the seismic wave and the displacement of the antenna, we can scale this using uh, the distance of the station. And we find that um, uh, using uh, using the vertical displacement or not on the horizontal, as I showed you before, the magnitude is known more or less 20 seconds uh, after the um, occurrence of the earthquake. In the case of Samos, which occurred last year, two years ago, um, what we learned more was that if we plot the stations across on a long stride, we find something very interesting. So in blue, you see stations projected um, uh, across the strike, like here, for example, station Samo, which is here, magnitude seven, scales very well with the, with the moment magnitude of the earthquake from seismology, and 093A, etc. But if you look at stations uh, along the strike of the fort, like here, Aydin, you see that uh, the energy is depleted. So the stations across strike are more are better, they scale better with seismic energy than a long, than a long strike. So the, the, of course, we, um, this is due to the asymmetric response of the crust around the earthquake epicenter. But we can also, and, and the fault reduction, but we can also see, for example, that some stations like here, station Ika U, which is this station here, has recorded a high magnitude near seven. Why is that? Because despite the fact that is more or less uh, at uh, 45 degrees angle to the strike of the fault. This probe is due to the directional effect that the earthquake ruptured from east to west. So there is a directivity effect recorded on GNSS. For in terms of pre-seismic deformation, uh, the problem is more difficult here because of the amount of um, the deformation that has to be detected by INSAR or GNSS. So we look at the baseline between station in Lefkada those are two onshore stations 
uh, in the north of Kada Spanohori and the south of Kada Pond. This is before the 2015 earthquake. You see the baseline shortens systematically uh, with an amount of 2.4 millimeters per year. So this is the amount of this. This can be correlated with the strain energy that is uh, accumulated um, along this fold of ruptured. So there's a clear pre-seismic deformation detected by GNSS. And um, to um, say a few words, what, what um, can be done in the future and using these data sets, of course, uh, one of the big questions is the fault coupling. Uh, where faults are coupled and where faults are not coupled, uh, where there is creep, where there is after slip. For here, an example for the of a strike slip earthquake showing uh, a slip deficit, a shallow slip deficit. For example, as in the case of 2020 in East on the East um, Anatolian Fault or the um, rupture in um, 2015 Lefkada earthquake. Um, we have uh, rupture at the depths of um, three, four kilometers and deeper and not in the surface. So we, you can use the data to, to see where the coupling is stronger. And of course, using that, we can say a few words about the seismic potential. And um, looking at strain patterns uh, along uh, big faults like Efalonia Transfer, Moista Anatolia, San Andrea, etc., we can. Um, we can differentiate. Uh, uh, we can differentiate the uh, the segmentation pattern. Let's say looking at INSAR or geodetic data. So if you look at the, if you know the segmentation pattern, and uh, then um, you you can uh, probably, for example, here in this in this part you, you have we have one in terms of uh, geology one segment, but in terms of fractures there are two segments. So one question is, is this something permanent or in the future you can have one rupture um, that can rupture all the way, the whole uh, 50 kilometers of that, of this, um, of this segment. So the geodesy insert in Genesis can bring more information on this modeling. Uh, and the same is uh, true, of course, from all major fault zones. Um, another interesting question is, um, uh, is the um, segmentation persistent or migrating? Um, for example, here we have the 2020 earthquake um, in the East Anatolian Fault that ruptured the uh, segment number four, Puturge. But um, uh, it's not clear if um, the same segment ruptured in the past or uh, the of or the earthquakes or earthquakes from the uh, northeastern segment, segment number three, propagated here in uh, number four, or vice versa from four to three. So this is very important because um, uh, this um, uh, segmentation uh, is uh, has to be uh, has to be investigated if it is related to long term sleep deficit or there are some discontinuities that um, uh, are responsible for that. And this is, in fact, the, the case for all major faults, either thrust faults or um, strike slip or normal. Um, this is the same, uh, the same question. So we can use this data to investigate that and come up with um, uh, some, uh, some better understanding of, of these, these patterns. I'll give you some papers if you want to read more about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, would anyone have any questions that they want to ask, either uh, points of clarification or further explanation or any particular results? Do you either um, just put your hand up and, and you can ask the questions or if you want to put them in the chat, please do. We've just got a couple of minutes. So uh, if you do have a question, please ask quickly. Also, so just mentioned about um, looking offshore 
uh, using geodesy um, and that it's emerging. Do you have a sort of a couple of comments on where we are with that? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's an emerging branch of geodesy. Uh, there are some, the, the future is, is bright, of course, because we need more data um, offshore. Some, a lot of faults are located offshore and we need more data close to the faults. As I mentioned before, it's crucial that you have um, data uh, as close to the fault as possible. So we use Genesis for the onshore part, but for offshore, we don't really have any data. The last 10 years or so after the Tohoku earthquake, this started. Um, this history started in Japan, also now in California, in Alaska, they tried to uh, put some sensors on the seabed and try to triangulate this with um, onshore stations to have an accuracy of a few centimeters. Um, I think it's very important, especially for the Eastern Mediterranean, Mediterranean in general, because we also we have um, the danger, not only from shaking, but also from tsunamis. So um, I'm not sure if you are familiar with the debate, if the um, uh, Hellenic Kark, for example, south of Crete can generate a big earthquake along the interface or not. So uh, all the models indicate shallow, um, um, let's say, or some typical models, let's say not all the models, they indicate some low coupling based on GNSS, which are onshore. But the GNSS stations are located about, you know, many kilometers, maybe 50, 60, 100 kilometers away from the um, location of the plate boundary. So the offshore geodesy will bring more data on this particular aspect to be able to locate uh, coupled uh, versus highly coupled versus less coupled uh, segments or patches along the mega thrust. As I showed you before, the 2018 earthquake offshore Zakynthos was located on the mega thrust. So this part of the arc is coupled, highly coupled. Um, and this continues all the way south east to offshore Kifira and then south of Crete. So I think it's a lot of potential there. I urge people to, um, to uh, get engaged with this uh, new branch. I know a few people, they are working in GFZ, for example, in Germany, they are working uh, already in, in France. They have a um, uh, few people start, start looking at this as well. Great, thank you. Well, Afanasos, thank you again. I uh, really appreciate it. Learned a lot today, and I'm sure everyone attending did as well. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone of our next session. We will have Graham Weverill, um, who will speak on from root to branch, preparing, integrating, and interpreting earthquake data to develop seismic source models for PSHA. And that's taking place on Monday, the 21st of February, at the same time as we had our session today, two o'clock for those of you in mainland Europe. So thank you, everybody, and uh, see you next time. Thank you.